Yes, Jesus is the burden bearer. But that's not the end of the story. He wants you to be a burden bearer also. Because there are many people around us who have burdens that they cannot bear. How many of you know that? All around us are people who have burdens that they cannot bear alone. And they are crying for somebody who will come by their side and lift that heavy burden. Stand by them for no other reason except out of a heart of compassion and love. The reason why we want to help people, there's only one reason. The reason why Jesus wanted to help people. Jesus did not expect anything back from anybody. He just ministered to people because he was God. And he is God. He ministered to people because he knew he was the only one who could give them what they needed. He ministered because he knew that if people did not come to him and experience his grace in their lives, there will be no help or no hope for them. And you know, this is true in your world. Because the people you know, the people you love, the people who come across your pathway, you may be the only person who can minister to them and help them and bring them from death to life. And if you don't... Asaka, can you just knock the fan off, please? Thank you. Uh, And if you don't go out of your way... Did you hear that? If you don't go, loud please. If you don't go out of your way, you can't help them. You got to take time. You got to spend some energy. You've got to care. You've got to listen. You've got to connect them. You've got to do whatever is necessary to bring them to the only person who can help them. The only person who can really help people is not a man, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we partake of the Holy Communion because we are so grateful, we are so thankful that Jesus climbed on that cross for us. He didn't have to. Jesus was totally sinless. No human being, no person born of a woman on this planet ever is born without sin. The only person who was born into this world without sin, was the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was he without sin? Because he was miraculously born. He was virgin born. If if he was born any other way, he would have had the stain of sin on him. When God decided to come down to earth, that entry into earth had to be in a cataclysmic, miraculous, supernatural way. It stands to reason. We are human beings. God is in heaven. And if God is to come down physically, he cannot come the normal way, is it not? It makes sense. Everything that God does makes sense. It doesn't make sense to us at some times, at times, but at the end of the day, it does make sense. When God came down to earth, he had to come down in a way that ordinary human beings 
cannot come. And after Jesus came down into this world and he explained to us who God is like. How did he explain that? He explained that by the words he spoke, by the miracles he did, by the people whom he raised from the dead. And he did more miracles while he was on earth than they could even record. We read in the book of John. And the writer of the Gospel of John, John himself says, that if he were to document all the miracles that Jesus did, even the world would not be able to contain the books that would be written. So Jesus did many more things than we read about in the Gospels. Jesus did about 37 miracles that are recorded here, but he did a lot more than that. Amazing. What God did, he didn't do in a corner. He did for the whole world to see. Why did he do that for the whole world to see? Because no man on the judgment day will be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know about it. Or you say, what about people who have never heard the gospel of Christ? You know something? Even they have no excuse. You know why? Because the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that there is a law written in the heart of every person. You know what that law is? Every one of you knows that. You know what that law is? That's what we call the conscience. Every human being knows that it's wrong to molest, to rape, to murder. Do you need to go to school to learn that? Every human being knows that it is wrong to lie. You have to be taught about that? What is it that tells you that? Paul calls it the law written in the heart. Okay, then if every human being knows that something is right and something is wrong, then he should try to find out how he can live right, okay? And everybody knows that however much you try, you cannot live a perfect life. Even if I can live a perfect life from today, my life has not been perfect up to now. So we're all stained with sin. It makes sense to think that if you have some dirt in your life, you cannot be in the presence of a holy God, if there is a God. Therefore, any rational person any thinking person should seek the truth, is it not? You can't sit in a corner and say, if God wants to save me, let him save me. Any person who has any kidneys ought to think like this at the end of the day. There must be a God somewhere. Well, I can't believe there is a God. Okay, don't believe there is a God. But look for the truth. Go after the truth. Read all the holy books. Read all the philosophies that people have mouthed over the centuries. And then read the Bible. Again, any rational being ought to read the Bible because it is the most circulated, published book in the whole wide world. Your education has been sadly neglected if you don't read the Bible. Because that's a book that is still the biggest seller in the world and nothing comes anywhere near it. So you can't say I don't read the Bible and I'm going to find truth. You haven't read. If you haven't read the Bible, read the most published book in the world. It's impossible to ignore the Bible. It's impossible to ignore the Lord Jesus Christ.
It's impossible to ignore these things and then blame God at the end of it. Now, the point of it is this. If you are a genuine seeker of truth, genuine seeker of truth, rather than trying to suppress the truth, then God will send somebody your way. I was interested, uh, very uh, chuckled to read in the newspaper uh, about a week or two ago where they had a journalist convention or something. And there was a speaker from India at that convention. And he said these words, not mine, and I don't think he's a Christian. He said, the King James Bible is a must read for all journalists. Did you hear that? The King James Bible is a must read for all aspiring journalists. I don't know how many journalists are here, but you know, <laughs> sad day if a journalist hasn't read the Bible. <laughs> According to this illustrious a uh, journalist from India who I don't think is a Christian either. It's impossible to ignore Jesus because Jesus is the world's sin bearer and Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is your Savior. Jesus is mine. How many of you can say, Yes, I thank the Lord that He saved me? Yes. I just want to read one verse from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, and verse 26. And this goes back to the event of the crucifixion, where Jesus had to carry the heavy cross on his back. On the Via Dolorosa, there are seven stations of the cross. And we're going to read a verse from the, probably the fifth station of the cross. And Jesus is carrying this heavy burden all by himself. After being whipped, after being beaten, scorned. Jesus was not a sissy. I don't think Jesus looks like some of these pictures that we see of him. The older I get, the more I want to see Jesus. Because I know the day is getting closer. And even if you're 16, your day is getting closer. <laughs> don't think he's an old man, hair is falling off, his teeth are probably falling off. That's why he wants to see Jesus. No, tomorrow you'll be older than you are today. So you are closer to seeing Jesus. If he doesn't return in glory, you're going to face it one day. I don't know what Jesus looks like, but... Oh, I wish I was there. One part of me says, I wish I was there. The other part of me says, no way, because I might have been one of those who would have shouted, crucify him. I'm so glad I was born when I was born. How about you? Maybe you would have, <laughs> say, maybe 10 years <laughs> later. <laughs> anyway, Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, we read verse 26, and it is the account of how somebody else was mobilized to bear Jesus' burden. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Again, I want you all to read it with me. Verse 26. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Jesus. Now look at this. Jesus is carrying the cross. Whose cross is it? Whose cross is it? Jesus' cross. Right now we are looking at the story, okay? 
Who's going to be crucified? Jesus. So whose cross is it? Jesus' cross. And it's heavy. And he's carrying it just before he climbs up to Calvary. And he's burdened. And it's heavy on him. I don't know what Simon of Cyrene would have been thinking. The poor guy was coming from the country. Simon of Cyrene, that's a place in northern Africa, Libya. And he had come probably for the feast. Coming from the country, not knowing what is going on. And as he walks by, one of the Roman soldiers or whoever is there says, Come on, get under that cross. I don't know what the guy would have, would have gone through his mind. Hey, man, what's the problem, dude? I'm just, just minding my own business. Roman soldier, get under that thing. The Romans were in control, and you dare not retort. And Simon of Cyrene probably grumbled. I would have. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Somebody else's cross. Why should I bear it? And if Simon of Cyrene didn't know anything, this is probably a criminal. And I am being asked to bear the cross of this person who has been condemned. He gets under it. And with all the strength he has, he lifts it. How many of you have been compelled to bear somebody else's cross? Ever. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. One of your family members has a problem. And you have been compelled to bear that burden. Okay, you know anything about that at any time in your life? You all are hesitant to admit, but I know by revelation that it is true. (laughs) Somebody has a broken relationship and they think you're the only one whose shoulders are big enough that they can cry on. And they come and tell you, and you have to bear that burden. Someone has a wayward child. You get only one chance. So they don't know how to deal with that situation. And they come to you, and they tell you, all about their situation. Somebody has a breaking or broken marriage. Somebody has a critical financial problem. Somebody is getting oppressed by their boss. Someone doesn't know which way to turn. Right or to the left, they are making an important decision. They don't know where to turn. They seek you out. And then you've got to listen to that burden and get under that burden. And you are bearing a burden that does not belong to you. You know about that? Okay. Well, Simon was in that situation. All around us are people who are hurting, who are oppressed, who are bound. And you're the only one who can get under their burden. I'm not just talking about a cross now. We're talking about somebody else's burden. And oftentimes you're compelled. You're compelled. Just like Simon of Cyrene was compelled. It was not a matter of choice. He didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't know what was going on in Jerusalem. He just happened to come by from the country. He was doing his own business. And he gets compelled to bear somebody's burden. But you know, as I look at that story, I think about how fortunate Simon was. 
because somebody else's burden is an opportunity to get close to Jesus. If someone by some revelation had told Simon, Simon, do you know who this is? Simon, do you realize this is the virgin born son of God? Simon, do you realize that this is the Messiah that all of Israel, the prophets of old, have been prophesying about? No one else can get so close to him. You are right there behind him, close to Jesus. Remember this. Whenever you become a burden bearer, you might be in a hot spot. But a hot spot can be seen in two ways. It's a time to connect. It's a place to connect, right? A hot spot is a place where you can connect. And you get pushed into this hot spot. It's your opportunity to connect with Jesus. Get close to him. Because in the process of helping somebody else and bearing somebody else's burden, you have an opportunity to get close to Jesus. And most of us would never get close enough to Jesus unless we had some pressure on us. Simon got close. And he helped. I don't know whether he had any conversation with Jesus. And I don't know whether Jesus spoke any words to Simon and said, Simon, thank you. Or, hey, thank you for helping me. But it was a high climb. Because they had to climb to the place of Golgotha. The place of the skull called Calvary. I'm so glad our church is called Calvary Church. <laughs> Aren't you? Huh? I am so glad this is Calvary Church. There's no better name that you could give it than Calvary Church, the place of the skull where Jesus climbed with the help of Simon of Cyrene to die on that cross on either side were criminals. Now what happened to Simon? I'll tell you what happened to him. Because he got underneath somebody else's burden. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15 and verse 21, and Mark is writing years after the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon of Cyrene, we have more information about him. And the information is this, that Simon had two sons called Rufus and Alexander. Now the gospel writers would not have mentioned those names if not for the fact that Rufus and Alexander were well-known Christians in the community. There is no other reason to mention the names of Rufus and Alexander as sons of Simon of Cyrene. Every time you bear somebody else's burden and you get close to Jesus, there are rewards that you can never ever imagine that are going to come your way. You don't have to look for the rewards. They are all unintended consequences of coming close to Jesus. Something happened to Simon because he got close to Jesus and he carried that burden. After Jesus rose from the dead, he probably heard who he was. And Rufus and Alexander, his sons, came to know the Lord. Can you think of a better reward than that? Huh? Can you think of a better reward than that? Here the guy was just minding his own business and walking out of the country to, to not knowing what is going to happen. And then he gets mobilized 
and coaxed into bearing somebody else's burden and he doesn't know anything about what's going to happen and the result of it is that Rufus and Alexander, his sons, come to know the Lord as their personal savior and they even become prominent people in the church. Obviously, that's why they were mentioned. How about that? How about that? Because the moment you get close to Jesus, not only do you get some unintended positive consequences of your coming close to Jesus, but you set off a chain reaction in your family circle, in your circle of influence, Whoever is connected to you, all of a sudden, the hot spot begins to flow in that connection and people begin to feel and touch and experience the Lord. All because you came under their burden and you were interested in helping them. And you know very well, many of you, you will be sitting here today, except for the fact that somebody close to you told you about the Lord, right? Somebody collared you on a Sunday morning maybe and said, let's go there or somebody shared the gospel with you and you go back in your life story and you analyze it you will realize that what was an accident is actually an accident of purpose. There are accidents on purpose. (laughs) Somebody sent me an email, not somebody I know who sent me an email, this week about an accident on purpose where there's a con man in Colombo going around with a uh, cane pretending to be blind and so on. That's an accident on purpose. But this is an accident of purpose. What looks like an accident to you is actually the purpose of God moving in your circle to touch your life and the lives of others. Aren't you glad that God works behind the scenes Working on my behalf, he's working for me because I am his focus. You say, but what kind of ego do you have to say that? I'm just telling you what's the truth of the Bible. God's eyes, when he looks down from heaven, he's looking at you. Really, if I may put it in an exaggerated way uh, so that you may get it, God's primary interest is me. Say that. God's primary interest is me. Why? Does that make sense too? If you're a, you know, you have some kids, or if you're not married and you have a brother or sister or some siblings, who am I interested in primarily? Those people with whom you have a blood connection. Now sometimes they, those guys behave in a miserable way, but still, <laughs> heart of hearts, <laughs> your heart is there, right? In the book of Romans, chapter 16, and verse 13, the Apostle Paul has his massive thank you list. He must have had a great memory, Paul, because in chapter 16 of Romans, he writes the names of all the people who have helped him and for little things, you know, piddly little things that you think that men won't really worry about. It's not you know, that kind of the things that men really worry about. But, uh, or remember even. I mean, some guys forget even their wedding anniversaries, so what do you expect? You know. And I have a pastor who, when he had a baby, his wife had a baby, and when he came rushing into my room uh, uh, and said, uh, you know, uh, 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 you've got a girl, and, uh, and, uh, and think of what name to give her. And I asked, what's the name of your mother-in-law? He couldn't remember. (laughs) Interesting, huh? But you know, Paul, when he was giving his thank you list, in verse 13 of Romans chapter 16, he thanks Rufus, beloved in the Lord, he says, and his mother and mine. What does he mean by that? That means Simon of Cyrene had a wife 
whose name is not mentioned. That's another thing in those days. You know, they didn't really care for it. Sorry, ladies. They didn't sometimes even mention the names of you girls. I'm glad things have changed. So anyway, his mother's name is not given. But she probably took care of Paul like a mother. And so Paul says, please greet Rufus, beloved of the Lord, and his mother and mine. Isn't that fantastic to be, you know, called, uh, you know, the adopted mother of, of Paul? Not bad, huh? What a promotion for Simon's wife. All because of what? All because of what? He bore somebody else's burden. That's what happens. That's why the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 says, Because we also are called to bear other people's burdens. And that Paul calls bring up what is lacking in the cross of Christ. That's a loaded statement. There is nothing lacking in the cross of Christ in that sense, but when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he left some work for us to do. And every time you take, make a choice to bear somebody else's burden, you know what you're doing? You are carrying the cross. The cross is not your broken down car, your sick wife, or your grumbling husband. The cross is not anything involuntary. The cross is something that you pick up by choice. Jesus said, you got to pick up the cross. The cross <laughs> is a choice you make to do God's will at your cost. And deny yourself. How many of you know when you go to a hospital to visit somebody, you could be doing something else, but you do it because you're bearing somebody else's burden and you want to bring some cheer and pray for them. And when you give up, the bigger sacrifice you make in order to carry the cross, the deeper your intimacy and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It all depends on the price you pay. The price you pay is equal to the devotion and love that you have. People who don't sacrifice anything for Christ will have no love for him either. But when you sacrifice, by choice, voluntarily, that's taking up the cross. And when you do, your love for him will grow. And when that love increases, you'll sacrifice more. And one day, the Lord is going to look at you and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He's going to reward you. Now, the thing is this, that if you look at this verse, Jesus is our burden bearer. Jesus turned it around. On the cross, he bore my burden. A burden that no other person could bear, only Jesus could bear. That burden is the burden of sin. And I'm sitting here today, I'm speaking to you today, and you are sitting there today, and you're thankful despite all your troubles and difficulties that you have been forgiven because Jesus climbed that cross and bore your burden. There is no burden that you can bear or I can bear that will ever sum up to the burden that Jesus bore. All the burdens and the troubles of people that we bear throughout our lives and from the day Jesus died up until now, if all those burdens that human beings bear were added together, it will not come anywhere near the burden that Jesus bore. Because Jesus came down from heaven. And the longer you travel, the farther you travel to bear the burden, the heavier and the bigger it is. Your pain is also a relative thing, is it not? If I were to take 
a person living in very luxurious circumstances, absolutely luxurious circumstances, and bring them to my house and put them in my office there, which has an air conditioner, do you think that would be luxury for them? Would it? Would it? No. It would be suffering for them. Don't you think so? Compared to what they're used to. It's a relative thing. On the other hand, if I go to a slum and pick up a person who is living in a one-roomed shack and get him and bring him to my office and put him there, he'll sit there and say, wow, I could live here. This is luxury that I've never known. Now what's happening here? Your suffering is a relative thing. It depends on where you've come from. Where you've been. And the better the place you're in, compared to what you're in now, the bigger your suffering. So can you compare heaven with earth? Anything on earth? Jesus came down from heaven. Therefore, the sufferings of Jesus Christ, our Lord, supersede all the sufferings of all humanity. They can do in the Philippines, they can go during Passion Week and get themselves crucified and so on. That doesn't come anywhere near what sufferings Jesus endured. Jesus bore the biggest burden for me. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. And as a child of God, he's asking you and me just a little bit. Get under somebody else's burden. Get underneath their heavy burden. Stretch yourself. Move on. Minister to people. And you will be rewarded. Not for that reason do we do it, but because that is the least we can do when we love him. As we prepare for the Holy Communion, I want to sing, Break Thou the Bread of Life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the bread beside the sea. Let's bow in prayer right now. And I want all of you to think about how many times others have borne your burdens. I want you to think about the many times people have come your way and you haven't borne their burdens. You haven't gotten underneath. You've probably said, hey, I'm from the country. I, I'm minding my own business. Just leave me alone. Don't let me get involved in this. It's a divine opportunity, a moment God has given. And I want you to say sorry to the Lord for that. I want you to say sorry to the Lord for that. Say, Lord, every opportunity that you give me to bear that heavy burden for others, I will do it. I will do it. I know that situation is beyond me. But I will do it because you have done so much for me, more than I can ever repay. Just tell him that right now. Just tell him that right now, wherever you are. And if you can, while we are in that situation, as a mark of your commitment, just put your arm around the person next to you. just to, as an expression of your commitment to do it for somebody else. All right? Do that right now. Why don't you pray for them, if you can? All right? Even if it's a silent prayer, pray for them right now. Say, Lord, bless this person and whatever burdens they have. Let me bear it for you. 
Let's do that right now. There's no better time than when we celebrate the cross to do that. Dear Lord Jesus, we come to you right now and we thank you that you are our burden bearer. But we want to step up and make our lives burden bearing lives for other people. We want to heal others, to set others free. We want to comfort others. We want to get underneath their burden. Just like somebody got underneath my burden. And just like you bore the burden for me at Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.